Welcome everyone to the Royal Melbourne Hospital's Victoria Trauma Grand Round for this year. Uh, my name's David Reid, I'll be chairing this event. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that's where at least hosting this meeting, meeting from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, our people logging in from overseas. We have registrations from Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Ireland, the UK, Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, and Fiji. And I think the Kulin mob would be quite proud about that. A few housekeeping uh, um, issues. Fortunately, I don't have to tell you to turn your phones off in this environment, and I'm sure you know where your own toilets are. Uh, but uh, the only way you can ask, ask a question is this is by the Q&A section down at um, the bottom of the slide. There's also be another uh, area where you can participate in the polling and I'll encourage you to do so. It's, it'll be lighthearted, uh, even if you don't um, feel you have the expertise, um, give it a go uh, because uh, uh, we are playing for chocolate, uh, so uh, your input is, uh, is important. Uh, another way, if you wish, is you can download the, um, the Slido app uh, and in, enter the event code, as you see on the screen there, VTGR2020. And if, you have any, if all of this technology fails and you have a burning question, then you can text our trauma nurse on that number there. Uh, our speakers will be taking their masks off so this, they can be heard clearly, but I want to emphasise that we are at a safe COVID distance from uh, our limited audience here. The program is as outlined there. We've got a, a, a fantastic selection of uh, speakers, all experts in the field. And I think I'll uh, get straight uh, into it by uh, giving a little bit of an outline. Now, it'd be remiss of me uh, to not introduce myself fur further as uh, this is the first uh, one of these I have been involved in. I'm taking over from uh, Professor Rodney Judson, who was a trauma director here at the Melbourne for many years and a surgeon for, um, for measured in decades. Uh, I arrived at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in April of this year, around about the same time as COVID, um, which uh, is coincidental. Uh, and this is the first time that I've actually put a suit on since I've taken off employment in this hospital. Uh, so you should all be very flattered. Although I know there's a lot of you uh, in our different parts of the world who may actually be watching this in your PJs, and I'm completely cool with that. So, um, traumatic brain injury, uh, it's, uh, it's a common thing, 10 million people, uh, annually in the world suffer traumatic brain injury. 700,000 uh, Australians are living with the consequences of an acquired brain injury, for, of which traumatic is uh, one of the more common causes. Uh, it takes up, it costs money, it costs days in bed, 200,000 bed days a year in this decade and a half old data. And although the majority, the 80% are minor, there are even more and more we're learning there are consequences uh, social, economic, um, uh, and uh, personal consequences of even the minor traumatic brain injuries. Uh, you can see how uh, we compare to the rest of the world, and those people uh, uh, from um, watching in from elsewhere can see how their individual nations compared about the prevalence of head injury in Australia was sort of middle green, and uh, I can see a rough trend to more head injuries the more north uh, one gets. And how it affects us day to day, well, uh, this data, if we look at it from Royal Melbourne, about a thousand major traumas uh, that we uh, treat every year. And of those, those with 40%, uh, uh, um, that's about 400, will have an element uh, of a head injury with an AIS um, greater than three. Uh, not those, all those will be isolated, they'll be in the, in the context of polytrauma, but that's quite a significant um, uh, workload. From the Victoria State Trauma Registry, uh, severe traumatic brain injury defined as uh, AIS um, greater than two, but also GCS um, less than nine. This is a registry sort of definition. Pretty stable at about between six and uh, seven uh, percent. Uh, that's statewide data. In the in the bigger centres, it'll uh, make up a bit um, higher at uh, Royal Melbourne, ten percent, and almost certainly very similar at the Alfred. As for trends, you know, they, we see some slight trends. The majority of the um, cause, of course, is transport related, as you can see on the graph on the left. And perhaps that may have decreased a little bit and there may uh, be a slight change in um, high falls there. 
uh, but this is 2017 to 2019 data, and uh, uh, 2020 has been uh, quite a different year, so we'll see what effect that has on these uh, numbers. And in terms of discharge destination, we have um, plenty of speakers uh, with a rehab um, focus, which is good because there's a challenge um, uh, that we have noticed a bit of a change over the last few years. Uh, about a third of our patients will go directly home. Uh, there has been a decrease in uh, transfers to rehabilitation uh, facilities and an increase in, um, uh, uh, in a hospital transfer for convalescence. And when we've looked into this, is actually uh, more, of, uh, more often we are making an acute hospital transfer for rural patients so that they can transition to, um, uh, to rehabilitation in a more local environment. So I think we'll uh, kick off uh, our program with a, um, a patient um, um, story. So I'd like to invite up uh, Christina Levy uh, and uh, Samantha Ioannidis up. Um, Christina is a physiotherapist with extensive experience uh, in neurosciences and a particular interest in treating patients with uh, traumatic brain injury. She's uh, worked at the Royal Melbourne here with us since 2014. Uh, and Samantha is a grade two occupational therapist uh, working with acute trauma service and neurosurgery here at the Royal Melbourne, uh, and she's experienced working with traumatic brain injury population in both acute and subacute rehab settings. Uh, and they'll be uh, uh, presenting to us a, a patient story. Good evening, my name is Christina Levy and this is Samantha Ioannidis. Today we are here to share with you a patient story. Firstly, we would like to welcome Henka and Alina who are online listening in to the Victorian Trauma Grand Round this evening and thank them for their consent to share this chapter of their lives with you all today. In October 2018, 33-year-old Henka and his fiancée Alina were travelling around Australia on holidays. Both Henke and Alina worked as doctors and lived in Finland. Henke lived a fit and active lifestyle. He enjoyed rock climbing, running and mountain bike riding. On October 18th, Henke and Alina's lives changed forever. This is Henke's story. four hours drive away from Melbourne. We were warming up, not even pushing ourselves to the limit as Henka's belaying device flew off the rock wall. And all of a sudden Henka fell and hit himself really badly to a rock ledge. Everything was silent then. I was alone on the ground. There was nobody else on the same climbing spot. I immediately climbed to the ledge to help Henka. I was in a total fight or flight mode and didn't know what to do. I knew Henka was really unwell as I saw him unconscious on the rock. I tried to dial the emergency number but I didn't have any connection to the network. I climbed up and down the wall trying to get some help and finally managed to get through. I spoke with the nurse and at the same time tried to support Henka and to prevent him from falling from the ledge. Henka was breathing heavily. His face was really badly swollen. He didn't react to anything that I did. I tried to keep his airways open with my fingers and empty his mouth and nose as he was curling blood and vomit. After one and a half hours, we finally got help. Henkel was flown to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. On arrival, his CT brain demonstrated extensive interventricular hemorrhage in the lateral ventricles, extending to the fourth ventricle, hydrocephalus, significant subarachnoid hemorrhage in bilateral frontoparietal lobes and the basal cisterns, bilateral frontal contusions with associated right frontal hemorrhage and diffuse cerebral edema. On day one after admission, 
Henga underwent a right craniotomy and evacuation. On day five, an EVD was inserted due to ongoing raised intracranial pressure. Henga also sustained multiple other traumatic injuries in his skull, face, chest and right arm. Throughout his stay at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, he had a total of 12 teams involved in his care. This included trauma, neurosurgery, intensive care, orthopaedics, maxillofacial, ophthalmology, nursing, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech pathology, dietetics and social work. His journey at the Royal Melbourne Hospital began in the intensive care unit where he spent 31 days. First days, I was afraid Enko was going to die any minute. Then I was afraid that he'll stay alive, but wouldn't be able to walk, talk anymore. On the 12th of November, Henker was transferred to the trauma ward. Henker experienced severe and significant impairments. On arrival to the ward, Henker's presentation was consistent with unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. This was assessed by occupational therapy and speech pathology by the coma recovery scale. Shortly after transferring to the ward, he improved to a minimally conscious state before emerging after 43 days. Occupational therapy then commenced assessment on the Westmead post-traumatic amnesia scale, which continued for the remainder of his admission. Henke first started communicating using a whiteboard and with time and encouragement, he was able to say his first words. Hello, Alina. Henker's physical abilities concurrently improved with his emergence from a minimally conscious state. He progressed from requiring a hoist to transfer to sit in a tilt and space manual wheelchair, to standing in a tilt table with assistance of four people, to then walking with assistance of two people. After 25 days, Henker's tracheostomy was successfully decannulated and he was soon after able to eat his favourite meal, spaghetti bolognese. Another key focus of the acute rehabilitation was to facilitate repatriation home. This involved carer training with the multidisciplinary team for transfers and problem solving to address toileting whilst on a plane. He had a length of stay on the ward of 35 days before being successfully repatriated to Finland. Working closely with Henker and Alina each day, his remarkable journey will always be remembered. For Henker, he too has some significant memories from the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Some of my memories from the neurosurge ward are some walks with the physiotherapists, and my occupational therapist Sam and I still remember some of the three words I was supposed to remember then keys cup toothbrush bird memories of food then I didn't think the food was was uh, particularly tasty Two years on from his accident. So hey everybody, I'm Henry Söderholm, a 35 year old guy from Finland, from a city called Lahti. Nowadays I receive neuropsychological therapy two times a week and occupational therapy at least one time a week. Financially I receive a so-called rehabilitational support from the local pension fund, which means kind of that I'm a full-time rehabilitee. I have to limit my daily activities nowadays because of neurological fatigue, which comes pretty easily nowadays. I actually have to, I think I have to take a nap after this. I try to keep fit by cycling, running, walking, etc.
and I've gotten back to climbing. Given the nature of Henker's injuries, the results are remarkable. Yet Henker acknowledges his ongoing deficits and that he will not be able to return to the medical workforce. In fact, he still requires assistance with some day-to-day -day activities, predominantly from a cognitive perspective. We acknowledge the Royal Melbourne Hospital's contribution to Henker's acute phase of his journey. On returning to Finland, he continued with extensive subacute rehabilitation. This story highlights the difficult and ongoing journey that patients with traumatic injuries and their, and their families endure, and the importance of the trauma multidisciplinary team. Thank you. Thank you, Christina and Samantha. Uh, great start. And uh, thank you to Henke and Elena um, for um, your generosity in sharing your story. Next, I'd uh, like to invite Alex Adamides up uh, to speak. He has uh, been a consultant neurosurgeon at the Royal Melbourne here since 2012. Uh, he has researched in uh, investigating the role of multimodality neuromonitoring in traumatic brain injury, and he was involved in the introduction of brain tissue oxygenation monitoring and cerebral microdialysis in traumatic brain injury in Australia. Uh, he's published extensively on cerebral oxygenation and metabolism. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, for the introduction. So, um, the outcomes uh, of uh, multiple randomized trials in traumatic brain injury over the last two decades, I would say, have been very disappointing. And this is uh, the latest one, the Polar study. Uh, which uh, once again demonstrated that hypothermia is not effective in uh, improving outcomes or reducing mortality uh, in these patients. Um, and um, it's uh, one more of the studies that have uh, been proven to be ineffective in this field um, of traumatic brain injury. And there are several reasons why that is the case. Um, we know that um, primary injury is not something we can reverse, and that's something that occurs at the moment of the impact, such as diffuse axonal injury where there is uh, disruption of the axons. But what we can uh, prevent potentially is secondary injury, which occurs uh, um, from the moment of trauma onwards and, and can occur several days or even weeks after the event. Um, the problem with traumatic brain injury, however, is that we can't pre uh, predict when it's going to happen, so we, can use a, we cannot use preventative uh, medications. Um, and it's also, um, um, in each uh, injured brain, there are so many different pathologies occurring at the same time, such as extraaxial hematomas, contusions, diffuse axonal injury, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, hydrocephalus. So, and, and all these processes change, um, not only in different parts of the brain, but also during time, um, as time goes by. Um, one possibility of uh, trying to improve outcomes is to use multimodality neuromonitoring, which uh, would enable us to monitor both um, uh, brain tissue oxygen and also metabolism. Um, and that can be achieved at least at a focal level by using a triple lumen bolt and introducing an ICP monitor, a brain oxygen monitor, and microdialysis monitor at the same location. I will focus on the brain oxygen monitor uh, today. Um, this is not new technology. This is uh, the, uh, the technology is based on the Clark oximeter, which was developed in the 50s. Um, the physics behind it is that um, there is diffusion of oxygen molecules through an oxygen permeable membrane uh, to an electrolyte solution. This causes a depolarization at the, uh, at the cathode, uh, starting an electrical current, uh, which relates to the amount of oxygen. Um, and um, this is uh, clinical, initial clinical experience uh, with the Lycox probes, which are the ones we are planning to use in our uh, forthcoming randomized trial. Um, so there are a couple of large studies. Uh, this uh, top study uh, at 118 patients were monitored. The monitor was very safe. There was only two small hematomas. None of them had to be evacuated. There were no infections. Uh, there was low uh, zero drift and low temperature drift. Uh, and similarly, another large study of uh, over 100 patients, again, found to be safe uh, and reliable. Um, we can see here from those studies that both the depth and the duration of cerebral hypoxia have an independent predictor on outcome. 
Um, so we know that the lower the brain oxygen goes, as well as uh, um, the longer the duration of that desaturation, the worse uh, the outcome in our patients. Um, and this is the first study we did here in Australia in introducing brain oxygen monitors in uh, traumatic brain injury patients. Um, because um, it was uh, the first time we're using these monitors, uh, for the first 10 patients, we simply inserted the monitors, we kept the numbers blind to the clinicians managing the patients, and then we just um, analyzed the data, collected the data, and based on what we found uh, and the literature, we developed uh, treatment algorithms through which we were going to treat the subsequent group of uh, 20 patients in an interventional uh, study. Um, and this is a treatment algorithm that uh, we developed. Uh, essentially, um, um, we basically tried to uh, optimize uh, parameters such as uh, CO2, uh, and we know that hyperventilation is detrimental in these patients. The same with cerebral hypoxia um, and uh, perfusion pressure. Um, if we look at the key physiological parameters between the two groups, uh, we can see that uh, ICP was uh, significantly lower in the treatment group. Um, N-tidal uh, was also higher uh, in the treatment group, uh, and that was statistically significant. Um, and also um, CO2, uh, oh, sorry, um, um, PaO2 was, uh, was different in the, in the two uh, groups. If we look at um, um, mean duration of uh, episodes of cerebral hypoxia uh, in the uh, first 10 patients, uh, that the mean episode was over 100 minutes, and that was reduced uh, down to by about a third uh, in the intervention group. Um, and we found that a lot of these episodes were secondary to hyperventilation, uh, inadvertent hyperventilation, uh, or reduced uh, perfusion pressure. Um, when we uh, compared uh, cerebral hypoxic events and systemic physiology between the two groups, we found that uh, brain oxygen was considered to be less than 15, which is considered to be ischemic in 10% of the time in group one in the patients that were not treated, uh, whereas that was reduced down by a third uh, in group two. Uh, although this was not statistically significant, there was a positive trend. Um, and we can also see that uh, inadvertent hyperventilation below 35 millimeters of mercury was reduced by about half, and that was statistically significant, um, as was uh, severe hyperventilation below 30. Um, when uh, we looked at uh, the frequency of episodes of uh, cerebral hypoxia in both groups according to the day from injury, we found that most of these episodes were happening on, day, on the uh, days four, five, and six. Uh, and we tried to speculate why was the cause for that. Um, and when we looked at the, the number of episodes of uh, um, hyperventilation, inadvertent hyperventilation uh, in, in black, uh, and when we look at the number of episodes of those hyperventilation episodes that resulted in brain hypoxia, we can see that even though on day two we have uh, the most number of uh, hyperventilation episodes, the uh, episodes of cerebral hypoxia are quite low. But if we go to day five and six, we can see that um, the uh, cerebral hypoxic events become far more uh, um, prevalent. And that we think is uh, relating to the fact that carbon dioxide reactivity, um, that is the reactivity of the vasculature to CO2, changes over time and actually increases as time goes by. And that was actually something that was shown uh, by this study. So you can see that CO2 reactivity is uh, pro progressively increasing from, from the day, day of injury to day five or six. When we um, tried to look at um, whether this intervention had an effect on outcome, we um, basically uh, designed a second uh, case control study. So we matched our uh, patients who have been monitored and treated with the brain oxygen algorithms to um, equivalent patients who have been treated at the same period at the same hospital uh, and who were matched for age, uh, GCS score, and injury severity score. And these were relatively well-matched groups. And we can see down here that um, the interventions uh, reduced, um, well, improved um, neurological outcomes and reduced mortality. But these were not statistically significant, because of, probably because of the small patient numbers. 
And then subsequent studies uh, conducted at a similar time period demonstrated similar results. This is from Korea. You can see that uh, um, the PBRO2 guided therapy had both better outcomes in terms of mortality as well as in terms of functional outcomes. Uh, and these are further uh, uncontrolled observational studies, again, suggesting that uh, monitoring and treating brain oxygen uh, potentially improves outcomes. But we need good quality class um, randomized trials, uh, class one evidence, actually, because this was a very sobering study um, by Randall Chestnut, who's um, done some excellent work uh, in the 80s in uh, uh, establishing how profound um, uh, effect on outcome do hypoxia and hypotension have in these patients. Um, because of ethical problems in running uh, a study along these lines, uh, he conducted a study in Bolivia and Ecuador, and essentially he randomized patients into ICP monitoring and treatment of the pressure compared to uh, essentially clinical management of head injured patients uh, with CT scanning and, and simply clinical management. Um, and the result was that there was no difference between those who were monitored and those with a monitor and those who were monitored clinically. So, um, the, randomized, the first randomized study that came out using brain oxygen monitors was the uh, BOOST-2 study uh, conducted in the US. Um, there were 62 patients in the ICP-only treatment group and 57 patients in the ICP plus brain oxygen treatment group. Uh, and um, functional outcomes were looked at six months uh, in terms of the Glasgow outcome scale score and the disability rating scale. And you can see here that uh, at six months, uh, there was a trend to significantly reduce mortality in the brain um, injury group that was monitored with the uh, ICP as well as brain oxygen monitors, um, and a trend in improved uh, neurological outcomes. However, um, this study, um, these results did not reach statistical significance, and, and this was the prelude to the uh, BOOST-3 study, which is currently ongoing in the US. And this uh, uh, study also showed, uh, similar to our initial study, that uh, there was a significant reduction in uh, cerebral hypoxic events, uh, or in the duration of cerebral hypoxia in these patients, by 77%. Um, and this led to the BOOST 3 study. Um, and this leads us to our local study here, the Bonanza study, which is the brain oxygen neuromonitoring uh, in Australia and New Zealand uh, assessment. Um, in patients with severe head injury, early brain oxygen monitoring and optimization will improve functional outcomes at six months compared to usual neurointensive care based on ICP and arterial blood pressure monitoring alone. At least that's our hypothesis. Um, this is uh, going to be based in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're aiming to recruit um, 750 patients over five years, uh, sorry, uh, 1,000 patients over five years. Um, and uh, we are starting a pilot study now, and we are in the process of uh, getting our governance here at the Royal Melbourne to start recruiting patients. So, um, we will, uh, similar to the PUSH study, we will uh, randomize patients into ICP monitoring only or brain oxygen and ICP monitoring. Uh, and uh, patients will be monitored for a minimum of 48 hours um, and they will be um, included in the study within the first 12 hours. Um, this is the treatment algorithm for the ICP management protocol. Uh, very busy, so I will not go through it. But, um, and this is the one for the brain oxygen monitoring um, uh, algorithm, uh, and essentially a lot of these um, optimization strategies uh, aim to improve uh, oxygenation, aim to uh, uh, prevent um, inadvertent hyperventilation, optimize hemodynamics. Um, we're using a new version of the Lycox monitor and the ICM uh, Plus software, which was developed, developed in Cambridge uh, at the University of Cambridge, uh, primarily for the uh, brain oxygen uh, for the pressure reactivity index, but uh, there are a lot of capabilities that uh, can be um, um, used uh, through the ICM Plus. Um, this study has been funded generously by these bodies, and uh, we have $4.4 million to uh, conduct the study. 
Um, I'd like to acknowledge some of my co-investigators, uh, especially Professor Andrew Woody and Associate Professor uh, Martin Han, both of whom have been the um, um, leaders in setting up this study um, and who approached us to, to be um, involved in the study. Um, very thankful to Kate Ramon, who's present in the audience today and uh, is about to present as well. Uh, Kate, you've been a great resource in uh, bringing the study here. Uh, and I'm also grateful to James Anstey, who's uh, uh, the intensivist um, uh, at, on site here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, who will be leading the study. Um, and uh, of course, Shirley Valance, who's our coordinator. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Just a reminder, you can um, send your questions in now on uh, on the website and uh, uh, we will get to them eventually at the end when we have a, um, a panel um, session. Uh, we'll change topic now. Uh, something a little bit more interactive is I'm going to present four patients uh, with uh, traumatic brain injuries and I'm going to ask uh, of each of them when you would uh, commence chemoprophylaxis uh, for VTE, for, um, for DVT, VTE events. So uh, I know that a lot of you uh, may not feel you have the expertise to um, answer this, but we want you to have a go anyway, because what we're planning to do is repeat the questions after you've heard um, the pros and cons for earlier and later, etc., from the two experts. So uh, um, I encourage you to um, make your best guess. And of course, there are some uh, um, assumptions, uh, like if you feel like you needed a scan before that, just assume you've got your scan and the scan's all good. And uh, I, I said we're playing for chocolate. Uh, our speakers all get a little bit of chocolate, but uh, as judged, when we look at the results, uh, whoever has the most pull on the audience when we re-poll them will uh, be getting the dark chocolate and the other person will be getting the white chocolate. So there's some, uh, there's some encouragement for you because we all know that white chocolate is an abomination. Okay, case number one. Uh, a 69 year old uh, female kicked in the face uh, by a horse, not this particular horse in question. Um, uh, she fell backwards but had no head strike. Uh, a Glasgow 14 and her pupils were equal and reactive. Uh, she's in general good health. Uh, she came in expediently uh, to the Royal Melbourne and her injuries were basically maxillofacial. So quite complicated um, dental alveolar um, fractures facial lacerations uh, and a, a, a threatened, um, a not immediately threatened airway, but uh, uh, in time would have been threatened, so had that airway secured. As a part of uh, imaging, uh, the findings were this uh, small um, intracerebral hemorrhage near the, uh, um, near the anterior horn. Um, so we have a patient who we think is gonna be in hospital for the best part of a week, needing two, maybe three operations to sort out complicated facial fractures. Um, they're well, no blood thinners. Uh, they've got no neurology and, and um, that hemorrhage, as you can see there. So we would uh, like to open up the poll for the first one. Um, and the, uh, the answers will be the same for the, all of the patients. Uh, so when, uh, which, uh, you know, assuming everything that you wanna assume, when would you be most likely to commence chemoprophylaxis? And you can take comfort in there will be a wide variety of opinions on this. So, uh, right. okay, shall we, uh, we've got a few answers in, have we? Yep, shall we uh, have a look? Okay, shall we uh, look at uh, the, um, the next case, and that'll keep polling away there. Okay, a 31-year-old uh, male who uh, has two fall, uh, falls out of a tram, a very Melbourne-related injury. I'm learning that this, it's different from my previous experience as a trauma surgeon in the Northern Territory. Um, he had an accidental fall out of a tram uh, and, his, uh, and has suffered a head strike. His mate helped him um, to his feet and moved him to the shelter out of the rain uh, and unfortunately let him go a little bit early before he'd gained his uh, composure again and down he went again. A second head strike this time to the temple. Uh, this, uh, 
this man, despite the fact he's only 31, is quite frail and unwell with an underlying um, neurological condition. His neurology is as there, his pupils are equal and reactive, uh, and his uh, uh, Glasgow has been recorded variably as um, 13 uh, to 14. Uh, but uh, in summary, it appears to be an isolated uh, a head injury at this stage uh, with Sub, uh, uh, sorry, subarachnoid he hemorrhage anteriorly, a little bit parafalcine, a little bit of subdural, uh, and a, a small amount of intraventricular hemorrhages. So widespread small amounts of hemorrhage. So we'll open this uh, one up. Do we have enough for a sneaky peek? No. Go on, give it a go. We'll, um, we'll have a look now. Okay, all right, we'll move on to the next one. So uh, case three is a 19 year old male involved in a rollover uh, motor vehicle um, collision. Uh, it was found unconscious at the wheel uh, uh, in the car in a field, we presume it's rolled over and it's um, landed um, wheels down. Uh, at the scene, uh, he was uh, assessed as having uh, a Glasgow um, of uh, four there, uh, and Ambulance Victoria uh, made the decision to intubate him at the scene. So his injuries are as uh, dictated there, intraventricular hemorrhages, facial lacerations, uh, some spinal injury, and a grade three hepatic injury. So in summary, we have an intraventricular hemorrhage uh, that eventually did get a, um, uh, an EVD inserted. So let's say it's after the EVD has been, time after the EVD has been inserted. Uh, we have a, a, a serious head injury via initial GCS, and we have a concomitant solid organ injury of uh, grade three, which is about mid, three out of seven. All right, so we'll open up that um, poll. So the intervals are about are the same. All right, we, okay, shall we have a sneaky peek? Okay. Still we'll move on to the, we'll move on to the next one whilst uh, people are still, uh, polls still open if you're still catching up, that's fine. And our final case is a fall off a motorcycle. I do not think it's this actual event here. Um, this 42-year-old um, male came home after, his, um, uh, after he came off his motorcycle, uh, lay down on the couch for a rest and was found unresponsive 45 minutes later. Once again, uh, once Ambulance Victoria arrived, um, Glasgow coma scale was three, pupils four millimetre. Uh, he was intubated at um, the scene. By the time he got to ED, he had a fixed and dilated pupil. A CT uh, showed a mass lesion, um, a subdural hematoma with a significant mass effect. Uh, and he, uh, of course, had an immediate um, craniectomy. So he's post-op after his craniectomy. There was quite a bit of swelling after the lid came out, so they elected to leave the lid out. Uh, he's projected that he'll have a long inpatient uh, stay for rehab. Uh, and he has no other injuries that are of concern that might be bleeding. All right, so we open up um, this poll. All right, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> All right, so now, uh, uh, now we'll hear from um, Professor Kate Drummond and Professor Chris Hogan, uh, and uh, they will um, uh, give us some insight on this um, the difficult problem of when to start um, VTE prophylaxis um, in head injury 
And then we're going to repeat that and see um, if that's um, altered your um, um, opinions. So I invite uh, Professor Kate Drummond up to speak next. She is the Director of Neurosurgery at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the head of the CNS Tumor Stream. Her research and clinical interests are biology and management of brain tumours. She's published over 120 peer-reviewed articles and received more than $9 million in research funding. Uh, she's Neurosurgery Editor of the Journal of Clinical Neuroscience and Chief Examiner in Neurosurgery for the College of Surgeons and Chair of Panagia Global Health. And to boot, she has an AM. So thank you, Kate. Thank you. Uh, it was really good to see Henke and Elena's story. Henke was my patient. I've got to take you to task. I never went to the trauma ward. <laughs> was on the neurosurgery ward, not the trauma ward. <laughs> uh, but what I really learnt from that was the effect on Elena, sort of the penumbra of the family um, of, the, of the person with the traumatic brain injury. It was exceptionally difficult for her. Anyway, so we, uh, my topic was VTE prophylaxis in traumatic brain injury, but I'm assuming that we're really talking about chemical VTE prophylaxis because we're not we're, like we're not worried about stockings and squeezy calf squeezies or anything. So I'm presuming that's what we're talking about. Um, so uh, this is this is what we're all worried about. We've uh, you know we've got day one and we've got day two. Um, either you know where the contusions really start small and then it's an awful word that we use where they blossom. I mean, you know, it's not really blossoming, is it? But anyway, that's what we're worried about, blossoming contusions. And so if we gave them some sort of anticoagulant, would that make that worse? Um, or this. So the subdural going from a small subdural to a big subdural, which is, I guess, that's probably a little bit of a moot point. We might have taken that one out. Um, but the other one where we've got a subdural we can't even see turning into a significant subdural if we anticoagulate the patient. So th that, this is what we're all worried about. That's what the background is. And so everyone's sort of like, well, when is it safe to give the patient an anticoagulant to prevent the very real risk of a, of a, of a DVT and a pulmonary embolus, which of course is equally as, well, equally as bad potentially as the head injury. So there's a lot of papers out there on this. There's a lot of really bad papers out there and I'd just like to point out at the beginning of my literature review, I started to get that feeling of that saying of, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting that outcome will be different. So just, just keep that in your mind when you see some of the, some of the literature I've got here. Um, so this is a nice article. This is from 2011. Um, and this is very, uh, this is, uh, very typical of a lot of the articles in the literature. Um, so basically someone wants to know if it's safe, so they get out their really, really big trauma database. Um, so they get a retrospective cohort study and they look at all of the patients who got early chemical prophylaxis and all of the patients who got late chemical prophylaxis, like there couldn't possibly be any selection bias there as to why they decided to give some late and why they decided to give some early. But anyway, without any of that selection bias. And then they exclude a lot of patients, those with intracranial pressure monitors, those with ventriculostomies, um, you know, those who are still bleeding, um, those sorts of people, often people who've had an operation, so most trauma patients. So they, they, do, they do a retrospective study with huge selection bias involving only a small percentage of the patients who we probably don't need to know about anyway. They do a lot of very fancy statistics uh, and they come out and they say, um, we found that it's uh, safe to give early VTE prophylaxis uh, and that um, not really powered for it, but it probably prevents clots. Okay, so that's 2011. Uh, so 2019, we thought, oh, okay, better. We've moved along here. Um, so what did we do? And this is Volker Seifert, super, super smart German neurosurgeon, one of the smartest men I know, and I think really a fantastic neurosurgeon. But, you know, there he is there doing this paper where 
Okay, so we looked at all of our admissions, um, and this look at this. This paper was published in 2019, but they looked at their admissions from 2012 to 2016 or something. So it took a while to get past the reviewers. Uh, probably went through a few journals. Anyway, uh, same thing. Uh, you know, they excluded all of the patients who'd had an operation or an ICP monitor or anything else. They looked at four groups: early, middle, late, very late. No selection bias there at all whatsoever. Um, they did uh, a bunch of fancy statistics to show that there was no difference between the groups, apart from the huge selection bias as to why they'd given the VTE prophylaxis at the time they did anyway. Um, and then they came out and said that uh, it's very safe to give VTE chemo prophylaxis within 24 hours and it didn't increase the risk of worsening bleeding. So, okay. That's one sort of study that, that we've got. And then we've got, worse still, the systematic analyses. Death by systematic analysis. Um, so uh, this is the Australia. We are not immune from the, from the craziness. So this one, I think, was, was it 20, 2013? And I don't want you to read all of this stuff. I just want you to notice the wonderful progression of knowledge you know, the, the moving forward of the field that we have here. So uh, systematic analysis, they found 16 studies, 16 studies um, that basically said, um, we think it's safe in low risk patients, ones that haven't had, you know, an ICP monitor, a ventriculostomy, an operation, and not anticoagulated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's in this journal, wait a minute, the Journal of Trauma Acute Care Surgery, okay, um, great, uh, and they found level four evidence for being able to give thromboprophylaxis relatively early at being fairly safe. It stopped clots and, uh, and it didn't make bleeding worse. So we move along to 2016. Amazingly, these people I only found 12 studies. I don't know where the other six, the other four went that were in the other, <laughs> that were in the other systematic analysis. Again, we're in this same esteemed journal, exactly the same journal, three years later. Um, we've managed to make it up to level three evidence with less studies and no randomised trials, and we've but we've come to the same conclusion that in patients who um, haven't had an operation, don't have a tube, like a tube in their brain, haven't got any other risk factors, that it's safe to give early VT prophylaxis and it probably stops clots and it doesn't make any bleeding. And then look, just because we weren't sure in exactly the same journal in 2020, because you know they had nothing else to do this year. It was COVID, they were bored, they were sort of stuck in the, at, 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 at home. Um, Miami decided to get in on the action. They've managed to find 17 studies, so at least we've gone an extra study to the original one from 2013. In the same esteemed journal, level three evidence again, that in patients with all of the same exclusion criteria, early VTE prophylaxis um, is probably safe, doesn't cause bleeding, and probably um, reduces the number of clots. So that's the state of the literature. I quite like this one because this really summarises it, and it had a nice picture there. Um, so this is a, you know, another, recent, uh, a, a, another recent review. Um, and what I liked about this one was that it put this very nice uh, this is actually a very nice little um, flow diagram where, so you've got all your types of head injury, no argument, everyone gets mechanical prophylaxis, that's fine. You then look and see if they've got a coagulopathy, if they're already anticoagulated, don't start heparin if they're going to go home anyway, um, active bleeding, but if they've had an operation, an ICP monitor, a ventriculostomy, okay, all of those people, if they've got no and you have a stable CT scan after six to 24 hours, which of course another study that I'm on says that you shouldn't do because it doesn't make any difference. But anyway, stable CT scan, six to 24 hours, yes, you can start the heparin. If they've got any of those other things, which is, will be most of the patients, yes, um, then it's individualized. So basically the experts should all put their heads together and decide what's the safest thing to do. Um, and if the CT scan is not stable, then they cross across to the expert opinion group anyway. 
Um, and they said that using this, um, basically, um, in the low-risk patients, these patients over here, very small numbers, who'd had a stable CT, it was very safe to give VTE prophylaxis early, 24 hours, um, and that it probably reduced the number of clots and it didn't make the brain bleed. So we're a little bit further ahead on what we're supposed to do. So my conclusion after reading all of these papers till three o'clock this morning, trying to work out what I was going to say this afternoon, do whatever you like. <laughs> no, not really. Okay. My real conclusion is the evidence is very poor. Um, chemical VTE prophylaxis is safe in patients with TBI with stable scans, normal clotting, and who haven't had any intracranial surgery. That seems to be generally agreed. That, of course, is a very small proportion of the patients who we see. Um, and the best I can come up with for the rest, for the rest of the patients is, in fact, that there should be a and I think this is what we don't do, which causes the problem. There should be a daily intentional consultant review of the nuance, the benefits and the risks of starting, you know, starting prophylaxis. Uh, and that's what we don't do. We don't actually have the people looking after the patient think every day, should we start should we start chemical prophylaxis today? What are the risks and benefits of that in the context of the whole patient, not just their traumatic brain injury, but also uh, their other injuries, uh, you know, the other problems that they have and what you might need to do. Uh, so apparently questions are at the end. So that is the end of my talk. Thanks, Kate. So next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Chris Hogan, a consultant haematologist and the director of laboratory haematology at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. And also he has appointments at the Royal Melbourne and of Peter McCallum. His uh, interest in perioperative haemostasis, transfusion, critical bleeding and red cell serology. Uh, he's previously been the chief medical officer of the National Blood Authority. Uh, he's been a member of expert writing groups for NH and MRC uh, patient uh, management gu blood guidelines. He's an examiner in haematology uh, for the College of Physicians and Pathologists uh, and medical specialty coordinator uh, at the Royal Mel Melbourne Hospital Clinical School. So uh, take it away, Chris. Thanks very much. What can I say? <laughs> so. Um, look, thanks for the invitation to speak. I, I just want to let you know that um, uh, Professor Drummond is one of my ski buddies, and Professor Drummond is a surgeon. So when, when, when we go skiing, we've been to skiing in Japan not long ago. I go out for the day with Kate, and Kate says, Chris, this is where we're going. This is where we're skiing, and you're skiing down there. <laughs> Traumatic brain injury is my topic. <laughs> Okay, so, so the, in these um, injured patients, uh, polytrauma, th there are a whole range of perturbations of their physiology and things that trigger um, hemostatic derangements that can be uh, thrombogenic. And just, just to remind you that um, in, in trauma patients overall, I'm not talking about TBI patients, that, that Th uh, chemical thromboprophylaxis does reduce the incidence of DVT, but it, 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 the, the literature demonstrating that it reduces the risk of uh, pulmonary embolism or, or fatality is, is, very, is very thin. And, and in fact, I guess that's one of the things we're trying to do ultimately is to prevent a death or to prevent a major morbidity. So um, the, the, the background um, risk of thrombosis uh, as Kate has nicely highlighted, that there's uh, difficulties in, in, in looking at these papers. There's huge, I mean, trauma, trauma patients generally, there's huge heterogeneity in the, in the patient mixes. So it's hard to lump uh, these patients all together and, and make sweeping statements about them, I think, because of the, the clinical differences between subgroups. 
Um, and th there's a trend in, in some studies that the thrombotic ability uh, risk relates to the degree of brain trauma. Um, the, the main game we're trying to prevent pulmonary embolism. So the, 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 the data is, uh, there's not a lot of data. You can, you can see there in that table that there's a, a relatively low incidence of documented uh, PE in patients who have brain injury. It's slightly favourable compared to um, injuries at other, other sites. Um, again, our main game, we're trying to prevent fatality. Um, in, in, this, uh, in this survey, there, there wasn't a relationship between fatal pulmonary embolism and the site of injury. Um, and then, uh, again, the whole issues around the timing of chemical um, prophylaxis. Uh, how many studies do you want to look at? Generally speaking, I would agree with what Kate has said that the quality of the evidence is, is not high. Often there are only grade three uh, level evidence in, in these sort of uh, studies or meta-analyses. Uh, the, 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 the sweeping generalisation is, is around the 72 hour watershed that, that generally speaking after that uh, time point or that goalpost that the safety is um, increased in terms of um, thromboprophylaxis. Um, there's this so-called interrupted um, treatment where, where you, you, you stop it and you start it again. Um, if, you, if you have an intervention you need to do. Um, th th those, those studies, the, the most, let's try and get this to work. The, the, the best p-value is uh, in relationship to the interruption of the continuity of the chemical thrombo prophylaxis, whereas you can see the other, the other, um, sorry, the other indices or the other parameters that you might think might predict uh, VTE as being provoked don't have good p-values in that study. Okay, um, an, an, another study that looked at um, the timing, a, a, a Toronto cohort, and again, no big news there. Um, th th there was a, a difference in, in DVT rates uh, without an increase uh, in, in, in bleeding or the need for later repeat neurosurgical intervention. Um, this is a, uh, Kate, it's a dreaded meta-analysis um, by um, Abdel Aziz, and you can see that the, the conclusions of, of that meta-analysis um, are not world-shattering, perhaps. The, the, the spontaneous expansion uh, you avoid it in the after the, before 72 hours. Um, that if you commence the chemical prophylaxis, I think I'll take that off. Um, after 48 hours, the likelihood that you'll get re-expansion is not great. Uh, there was a, a trend towards lower expansion of hemorrhage with um, low molecular weight agents compared to unfractionated agents. Um, okay, moving on. Um, there's, a, there's a smaller study um, by Frizzoli et al, a New York study, and that did not show a difference in um, VTA rates or radiographic expansion even when you started earlier. Um, which agent is better to use? Well, there's a, a kind of massive N equals trawling, retrospective trawling uh, published in, in, in that journal. Um, and uh, there, there, it, it favoured the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin. So, I mean, unfractionated heparin um, has, if it has any advantages, it, it has a shorter half-life. So in patients without significant renal impairment, it will wear off quickly compared with a low molecular weight agent in the face of bleeding or a need to go back to theatre. Uh, it is reversible with protamine, whereas only about a quarter of the effect of a low molecular weight agent is reversible. But the, we all know that you can have two patients of the same body weight, uh, the same renal function, 
you give them the same dose of an unfractionated heparin, they have completely different levels of anticoagulation. It's notorious for a, a, a unreliable dose response curves compared to low molecular weight agents. Okay, um, in, in this um, review, the, I'll go back, the, the area where there's the best uh, p-value was simply in relationship to exposure to chemical prophylaxis. so that's something we could have worked out primarily, or um, uh, patients with high body max, max, sorry, body mass indexes, indices, also did poorly. Turn that off. Right. You can see I'm not a surgeon in terms of my motor skills. Um, so then, there are what do people actually do? Well, you can see in this uh, um, UK survey of uh, practice, there was uh, significant variation in practice. The consultants seemed to be a bit more driven than their registrars. Um, low molecular weight agents were favoured over unfractionated. And Kate, there was this huge variation in when you kick in. So really, we're, we're not getting a lot of clarity out of these papers. Uh, similarly, in a, um, another, it's times a European study look at looking at what people actually do, what they prescribe. And you can see there's, again, there's, there's variation in the the, the timing of commencement, um, and so on, imitating the other paper. Um, the brain trauma guidelines, um, they are rather vague from my perspective. They say it's a good idea to think about using it. And then they say there is insufficient evidence to support recommendations regarding the preferred agent, the dose or the timing. So they're very helpful guidelines. Not. Okay, the um, um, more recently published Austrian uh, consensus guidelines are a little bit more um, directive and they, they um, put forward the idea that you would consider starting the prophylaxis even before the 24 hours is up if the patients are very stable. One of the things that struck me as a non-surgeon reading all these papers is that they, they all talk about stable patients versus less stable patients, and you use that to decide how early to start, but they all have variability in what they define as stable and, and how often you should scan and when you should scan. And, and, and then on top of that, there's the heterogeneity of injury. So I think it's... Uh, I'm a bit in Kate's court here. Um, so I think I think it's I think what what Kate mentioned at the end of her presentation that one of the critical things is going to be careful, regular review at a senior level of the patients to help determine what you do, unless there are some trials in the future that give us more definitive guidance at higher levels of, of weighted evidence than, than are available at the moment. But I think those, those studies which we would like to see will be uh, delayed or maybe impossible because of we're talking about trauma and trauma is so heterogeneous. Um, other agents that we could use apart from good old um, unfractionated heparin or uh, low molecular weight agents, there, there are no studies that tell us uh, anything meaningful about alternative options. So thank you for listening. Thanks, uh, Chris. That's um, cleared it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as one, I would uh, mention that one way to uh, uh, aggravate surgeons uh, is uh, mentioning NOACs. Uh, so uh, you just sneak that in right at the end there. So what we might uh, do now is we might repeat those little um, uh, case uh, vignettes and uh, we'll see if uh, we will ask you to do the same and uh, uh, poll again and see if your answer has changed. Okay, case one. 
uh, so it's just be the summary slides this time. The facial fractures, uh, small intraparenchymal hemorrhage, no blood thinners, uh, neurologically intact. So we'll open up that poll. How are we doing for numbers? Coming along slowly? Then I might hit up Kate and Chris then. What would, uh, where would you, where would your range, where would to? Uh, So, with a normal scan A, yep. Yep. A. Okay, yep. Okay, so the uh, next um, patient uh, with that uh, fell out of the tram uh, with the uh, scattered um, hemorrhages, uh, subdural, subarachnoid, uh, and intraventricular. Okay. And we, uh, have we got a few? We've got a few uh, answers in. Yep. Okay. Uh, and uh, so your best case scenario would be assuming that your follow-up scans are okay, no deterioration. Too hard to say. He's, he's got an ICP monitor in. I yeah. mean, he's, he's going to blossom. Yeah. He could be up to a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, at least four to seven days. Okay. Next. Uh, next case. Okay, the intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, gla gla initial Glasgow 3, uh, and the solid organ injury. So we'll open, open that one up. So his solid organ injury is hepatic, mm -hmm. and in some of those studies, there was a relationship to between ongoing brain, brain bleeding yep. with chemical prophylaxis and severe hepatic injury. Yep. And uh, I, I think he's very risky. Okay. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a few votes in, have we? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, from the trauma and general surgeon's point of view, we'd sort of like uh, a grade three liver injury to wait for 48 hours. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, the head has its own preference, but that uh, uh, the solid organ injury um, does influence this a little. Although there are probably some very similar those retrospective studies that um, Professor Drummond talked about, suggesting that slightly earlier uh, commence, uh, commencing chemoprophylaxis and solid organ injury is probably safe with the same selection biases. Okay. His final score is three, yeah. and he's probably going to end up with an EVD. Yeah. And you're not going to want to start it until you've taken the EVD yep. out 24 hours after that. Okay. Next, uh, next case. This is a post-op um, uh, craniectomy. So I'll open that poll up. I'll give the uh, give them a chance to put their votes in. Got a few numbers in. Not yet. They're thinking a bit harder about this one. And our experts, the, I, I know that's difficult because you haven't got a lot of information. Not a lot of information. I yep. Mean, his, his primary injury and initial scans looked mm. terrible. Yep. Um, in, in terms of displacement. Yeah, the bone off, right? Yes. So the brain's going to be herniating out against those edges of mm. those bony edges yeah. and contusing itself and they're, get, they're going to get a venous infarct because the veins are going to be stuck up against the bony yeah. edges. So yep. not in the near okay. future. All right. Okay. And we'll close that one off. Okay. <laughs> Right, uh, and uh, will they give us a little bit of time to look at those results and decide who gets the good chocolate and the not-so-good chocolate. So we'll move on to uh, rehab now. Uh, so I'd like to invite um, uh, Professor John Olver up. He's the Professor of Rehabilitation Medicine and Department of Medicine at Monash, 
and Medical Director at, uh, of Rehab at uh, Epworth Healthcare. He's a past president of the Australasian Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine and the Asia Oceans, Oceans Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine. There are some acronyms for you. Uh, a recipient of uh, the AM, another uh, medal wearer, and uh, his interest, research interests are traumatic brain injury, concussion, spasticity, uh, stroke rehab, and he's co-authored over 95 um, papers and currently supervising six PhD students. Um, so thank you, Professor Oliver. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, just to outline the, uh, the unit that uh, I have at Epworth, we have uh, 20 rehabilitation beds dedicated for traumatic brain injury. Our average length of stay in moderate to severe patients is 30 to 35 days as an inpatient. Our average length of stay with a community-based outpatient program is probably three to five months. And we have a, an active uh, follow-up program that invites people back for review at one, two, three, five, 10, 20, and 30 years post-injury. And um, I can now confidently predict that the patients coming in next week, I will not be seeing at 30 years. So what I've been asked to talk about tonight is the management of behaviorally difficult traumatic uh, injury patient. And I've chosen one that um, we uh, kindly took from uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, and the issue with uh, behaviour management is every time you think you've got it right, the next patient comes in. So it's, there's um, a lot of variation in how we uh, manage it. But there are some sort of guiding principles. So this man was a 26-year-old uh, who was the unrestrained driver of a car who rear-ended a truck at high speed, greater than 100 kilometres an hour, in the context of a police chase. So just in that first sentence, you can get some idea that he wasn't behaviourally stable prior to his injury. He suffered from a closed traumatic brain injury, I'll give more details in a minute, and other multi-trauma orthopaedic injuries. His Glasgow coma score uh, was eight at the scene of the accident. He was reported to have loss of consciousness, probably only minutes, that wasn't fully recorded. And there was evidence of a prior history of drug use at the scene uh, because there were new used needles on the floor of his car. He required intubation at the scene and was taken to a regional hospital in Ballarat and then transferred to the Royal Melbourne Hospital um, subsequently. At the Royal Melbourne, he had an MRI scan which showed intraparenchymal and intraventricular hemorrhage uh, and diffuse um, axonal injury. He was seen to have a mild prominence of the uh, temporal horns of the lateral ventricles, suggestive of early mild acute hydrocephalus, and he had bilateral subgaleal hematomas. He also had a series of orthopedic injuries, pelvic fractures, right sacral ala, right acetabula. He had a right inguinal hematoma, which was quite extensive, and he had a right femoral fracture um, which uh, was um, uh, surgically uh, fixed with a K, uh, na a K nail and he, uh, on transfer to rehab, uh, was walking with the aid of a two-wheel frame, so partially weight-bearing with the fell pelvic and the uh, um, operated femoral fracture. In addition, uh, he had a fracture of the lateral mass of C5-6, which again required surgical uh, intervention and he had uh, a soft collar when he came to rehabilitation. He uh, had acutely a moderate right pneumothorax and uh, severe right pulmonary contusion, needed an intercostal catheter which was successfully removed and he had a grade one splenic laceration which was treated conservatively. So just on history alone, this guy's had a significant uh, high speed uh, injury with multi-trauma orthopaedics and a severe head injury. So when we look at behavioural management, um, we want to know a little bit about the past medical history. And uh, by quizzing his relatives and from the information we got uh, from uh, the Royal Melbourne, 
Uh, we knew that he had a history of uh, methylphetamine and cannabis abuse, and the Royal Melbourne had already involved a, an addiction medicine specialist uh, to look at um, him coming off the drugs and his longer term care. And we involved uh, our addiction medicine specialist who um, was going to follow him up in the longer term. But he also had a history of drug-induced psychosis. And at one stage in his life, he had an isolated diagnosis of schizophrenia, which wasn't really followed through uh, with. Now, the issue is that um, in some of the research that uh, we've done, Jenny Ponsford, who published it in 2018, we looked at our group of moderate to severe um, young men with a traumatic brain injury, and over a third of them, in fact, 38.5%, um, had uh, substance abuse as uh, prominent in their past history. And certainly, they had a high rate of a lot of these sort of comorbidities. And so it suggests that prior to their accident, they had a number of risk-taking behaviours, whether it was drugs or whether it was um, uh, the cause of the accident, which obviously in this case, a high-speed police chase um, shows uh, behavioural issues. But it's also worthwhile looking at the social history. Was there any sort of immediate precipitance? Well, this man had recently lost his job and it was not due to his behaviour or his drug taking. Uh, he simply, uh, his job was uh, as a hand in a cafe which was closed because of COVID-19. So he, he unfortunately was then unemployed. He was living in a boarding house but had recently been evicted uh, due to the fact that, of his drug use. And at the time of the accident, he was couch surfing uh, with a number of his uh, relatives. So again, uh, an unstable background. Now, most of the patients that come into Epworth come in uh, in the state of post-traumatic amnesia, the waking up state after coma, uh, defined primarily by the fact that there's no continuous memory for day-to-day -day events, long-term memory intact, short-term memory uh, in tatters. And the other issues with um, post-traumatic amnesia are usually a disturbed sleep-wake cycle and uh, behavioural discontrol, usually agitation and aggression, but in some patients they can be quite withdrawn and, uh, and calm. He came in, uh, we use the uh, Westmead post-traumatic amnesia scale, which was developed in Westmead Hospital in Sydney. Um, it's a scale out of 12 and he came in scoring seven out of 12. So he was confused, he was disorientated, um, his presentation, he was quite fatigued, but also he was quite behaviourally uh, disturbed at the time. So the issue is what was causing his behavioural problems? Because people without any history of um, behavioural problems or drug abuse can be quite disturbed in post-traumatic amnesia. And really in this time, you really don't know where the behaviour is coming from, but we have uh, standardised ways of attempting to uh, treat it. So the short-term goals is to manage the behaviour and manage the phase of post-traumatic amnesia and um, try even in this early phase to promote some sort of independence uh, if only in personal activities. Uh, it's been traditional in post-traumatic amnesia to use uh, an isolating environment, low stimulation environment. There's now more research that shows that that does apply to the moderate to severe patients usually, but there are a group of patients who can cope with more stimulation and we don't want to delay their rehabilitation, their trip to independence by um, putting them in an environment where we're not doing too much. The other short term goal was to find what his discharge destination was because his parents and sister made it quite clear on admission that they didn't want to have anything to do with him, that they'd already rejected him because of drug taking behaviour, so he had no fixed address. And uh, these days you have to start looking at that very early. His long term goals were to look at his addiction, see if we can change this and um, we return to normal function, and what that should have actually read, return to independent function, because his normal function got him into this problem. 
So at Epworth, we have a full interdisciplinary rehabilitation team, so neuropsychologists, physiotherapists, speech pathologists, dieticians, occupational therapists, social workers, etc. And we're trying to get people to their higher level of independence, both physically, psychologically, and functionally, in other words, being independent in purposeful daily activities. Now, this man's post-traumatic amnesia duration was 37 days, which on any scale of post-traumatic amnesia is a very severe injury. With patients who are very behaviourally disturbed in post-traumatic amnesia, we're now using a scale called the Agitated Behaviour Scale. Uh, and this showed that uh, it, it, during this time uh, of post-traumatic amnesia, he had a very short attention span. He was easily distracted, inability to concentrate. So that could describe any one of these patients. He was impulsive, impatient, had a very low pain tolerance, remembering his orthopaedic injuries. He had a very low frustration tolerance and he was wandering, even in our isolated areas, um, uh, constantly from his room. He was pacing, had excessive movement, he couldn't sit still. Uh, we have a uh, psychiatrist uh, who works in our unit who uh, crosses over between the Royal Melbourne and, um, and Epworth, which has been very useful. And coming to Epworth, because of his agitated behaviour acutely, he'd already put, been put on a lanzapine. He was, had diazepam uh, for drug withdrawal. He had clonidine, and I've never understood what clonidine does. And he was put on sodium valproate as another um, behavioural drug. Now these are all fine, we use them all, there is no evidence for any of them. Uh, the most commonly used drugs for behaviour uh, that we use in order to try and monitor better their emergence from post-traumatic amnesia, their emergence and confusion, is carbamazepine and a beta blocker. And even with those two drugs, there's a little bit of evidence in properly controlled trials with small uh, cases, unfortunately, for beta blocker, but not much for high dose Tegretol or carbamazepine, although it's been used for many years in um, uh, burnt out uh, schizophrenic to control their, their sort of behavior. So we try not to use um, uh, major tranquilizers, um, but in someone that's got extreme behavior where they're a, a problem for themselves or others, even in an isolated environment um, where we've got high uh, degree of nursing staff compared to the rest of the ward, um, we still have to use chemical restraint in more patients than we'd like to. And there have been some papers suggesting that the use of major tranquilizers, even like a lanzapine, uh, prolongs post-traumatic amnesia. So what we tend to use is um, the environment. And the central picture is a bed, a high-low bed, um, surrounded by um, uh, eight centimetres of foam rubber, and it uh, reduces uh, sight and sound stimulation. You can put a patient in there. These beds were initially um, made in Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado, and we bought the design to um, Epworth and have modified them. Uh, we don't put all patients in here, and we actually didn't put this patient. But again, reducing the stimulation often reduces the behaviour in post-traumatic amnesia. They don't use uh, restraints on, on arms or legs. They can thrash around without doing themselves any harm. We've got a mirror over that, like the mirrors on intersections, uh, to, to monitor them. And the nursing staff go in there when they're a bit calmer for um, basic uh, care and we don't give meals to them. If they're very agitated, we wait till they calm down. So the patient controls their management, but we're able to get their behaviour under control and stop a lot of the tranquilizers with the use of this type of environment and a section of the ward, which is lower stimulation. Um, so we use the same nursing staff on each shift so the patient becomes familiar with them. The instructions are always simple. There's a lot of frequent reassurance because the last thing they remember is being at a party or being somewhere and then they wake up in an environment. But because they've got no short-term memory, they can't remember what you've said about what the environment uh, they're in. Um, we regularly monitor their behavioural status. We limit their visitors. Um, we put up uh, pictures as, as we can of past history because their old well-learnt memory is intact. 
and that deals with over 90% of the behavioural problems in post-traumatic amnesia. Otherwise, we use carbamazepine for behaviour, we use high-dose beta blockers if, if, if appropriate, uh, but we do use major tranquilizers, and our drug of choice at the moment is olanzapine, and we have a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of the use of olanzapine with the behavioural uh, avert behaviour scale um, because we want some evidence that what we're doing is uh, correct. And uh, that, that uh, study has just started, um, but I really hope the person that we've got on it at the moment is on the placebo, otherwise we're in real trouble. Um, so when they come out of PTA, we've got then a different set of circumstances. We can then determine whether they've, um, uh, their past history is um, uh, influencing their behaviour as we see it. But uh, irrespective of where the, um, the, the head is struck in the injury, uh, as a sort of design fault, uh, most of our patients, in fact nearly all of them, have some signs of frontal lobe damage. And this is a breakdown of all of the behavioural um, problems that we see uh, in our patients as they emerge from post-traumatic am amnesia. And there are um, techniques of trying to deal with each of these problems, which obviously I can't go into in this uh, lecture. So what about the development of psychiatric disorders post-traumatic brain injury? Well, the prefrontal cortex is involved in executive function, and that's important for people's adjustment and adaption post-injury. And prefrontal cortex uh, disruption may result uh, in impulsive behaviours and uh, problems uh, in the long term with substance abuse, abuse. You can have the intent to stay off the substance, but you can't follow it through. And that's what we see in a lot of our patients. So our studies with alcohol have shown that most of our patients stay off it for the first year, but in our five-year reviews, many of them have gone back on it again. Um, we have seen every psychiatric problem mirrored that hasn't been present before after traumatic brain injury. Uh, and the circumstances, the prior history uh, and um, their family circumstances all um, feed into what we see in the, uh, in the longer term. And we've got to be uh, cognizant of all of this. So did this um, patient uh, help in his own rehab? Well, when we, oh, sorry, just before I say that, this is a slide uh, that was produced um, in 2016, which shows the sort of type of behavioural problems that we commonly see in the first five years uh, post-traumatic uh, brain injury. And you see there is a tendency for them to improve, um, but a lot of our patients, a uh, third to a half, have some sort of disordered behaviour in the long term. Um, so what happened with this patient? Well, we, when he came out of PTA, we did a um, communication assessment. The assessment could not be completed because he didn't have the cognitive ability to sit there and concentrate through a speech therapy evaluation. From a functional point of view, he could get his message across. Um, we know from the studies that we've done at Epworth that about two thirds of our moderate to severe patients have some sort of problems with sense of smell, not necessarily complete anosmia. We have an anosmia clinic, and because of this high number and another American study that came out a few months after ours showed that it was about 72% in their study of moderate to severe traumatic brain injury had anosmia. We, therefore, all of our moderate injuries, we test their sense of smell in an anosmia clinic at some stage. This person started to um, rail against the therapy that was being offered. So he refused to have an anosmia assessment, even though he had problems with um, taste. So he obviously had some problems with sense of smell. He wouldn't be talked into safety devices. He had gas in the home that he eventually went to, wouldn't have a gas detector uh, fitted. So again, this sort of risk-taking, defiant behaviour became more apparent as time went on. So what is the risk of psychiatric disorders. Um, well, this was a study that was published this year, post-TBI. Um, does therapy actually help someone not develop uh, psychiatric disorders? 
and this study looked at uh, 230,000 patients with TBI, 700,000 without, um, and found that rehabilitation therapy within 90 days of the TBI attenuated the risk of developing psychiatric disorders, and medium to high level intensity rehabilitation therapy was associated with lower risks of psychiatric disorders. So that was um, a study that shows that what we do in rehabilitation may be somewhat useful. So that's where I wanted to put it. So behavioural problems in the uh, inpatient setting uh, are difficult to deal with, but we must take a full history of what's happened before. We must have a special um, protocol for dealing with patients in post-traumatic amnesia that tries to avoid major tranquilizers, but in a lot of cases, probably 10 or 15%, that's not possible. Um, or we haven't worked out how to do it yet, and then we need to follow them in the long term to try and change their behaviour so that they don't get into this sort of circumstance of risk-taking and injury again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Olver. Just a reminder that uh, there will be a few minutes at the, after this talk uh, to field some questions, so um, uh, send them in if, as you see fit. Uh, our last speaker is Dr. Suyi Lee, who works as a rehabilitation medicine physician here at uh, Melbourne Health. Uh, she's very much interested in research and she's almost completed her PhD in disaster rehabilitation, focusing on traumatic brain injury. Uh, her other clinical and uh, research interests include neurological and multi-trauma rehabilitation. Thank you, Sue Lee. Thank you, David. And thanks for inviting me to speak tonight. So following from the previous presentations, I'll be covering the recovery and rehabilitation of traumatic brain injury. Just a very brief outline. We've gone through the epidemiology, so I'm just going to touch on that. And we know that it is um, TBI is associated with uh, high mortality and morbidity rates, and it can incur a huge socioeconomic burden on the country. Now, the number of TBI cases, um, they're often underrepresented because patients with mild traumatic brain injury, they do not routinely present to the emergency department. And it is also known as a, as a silent epidemic because their long-term impacts of TBI may be invisible. Just a, a table of the classification of TBI severity. We know that the, the, the more severe the TBI is, the poorer the function outcome. Now, I'm sorry for the busy slide. Um, this is a paper that we've done looking at the consequences of TBI. We know that it can cause lifelong impairments in their physical function, cognitive behavior, and social function. And uh, more often, the cognitive behavior and personality deficits can be even more disabling than their residual physical function. However, recovery from TBI can often happen even um, up to five years after the brain injury. This is one of the models of care. There are many models of care in TBI management, but this is one of them. I just want to highlight it. So patients with um, traumatic brain injury, they often come into the hospital. They get, they get admitted for acute medical and surgical management, and subsequently, they will be referred for rehabilitation. And rehabilitation, there are many phases of rehab. You've got the acute and then the subacute phases, and patients often get um, referred for inpatient rehab, if they have moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, and then subsequently they get referred for community services and community rehabilitation to continue their rehabilitation phase. And rehabilitation is most effective if we're um, using an interdisciplinary approach. So the main focus will be, um, as, as John has mentioned, so retraining of their mobility and their, um, their activities of daily living, looking at behavior and um, cognitive strategies, looking at pharmacological management. For inpatient service, and John did mention that as well, they're mostly on post-traumatic amnesia monitoring and um, strategies for, more, for patients uh, with more, di um, more disability and impairments. We'll probably have to look into environmental modifications, equipments, and then subsequently refer them for long-term follow-up um, in the community. So community integration, it is mainly looking at getting the patients back into the community, integrating them into that. And um, so, more often, we need to support the family, we need to support the carers. And 
and um, and that can happen using an uh, using a multidisciplinary team. So this is a section looking at evidence-based rehab interventions in adults with traumatic brain injury. Um, this section was extracted in a study that we've conducted not, um, not long ago, looking at critical appraisal of clini clinical practice guidelines in traumatic brain injury. Now, the ultimate goal of TBR rehab is to get the patient into the community, to integrate them regardless of whether their impairments can be eliminated. And it, it is important for us to know that. So this paper was published not long ago in the Brain Injury Journal. We went through different health science databases. We went through hospital organizations, um, developer websites, and clinical practice um, guidelines websites. So out of the, um, um, so we included clinical practice guidelines that contain a rehab component and a traumatic brain injury component. And we only included um, um, guidelines that are verifiable, which contains a review of systematic literature search of uh, existing guidelines that are published in peer-reviewed journals. We excluded guidelines in the pediatric population and um, those that contain a non-traumatic brain injury component, for example, hypoxic brain injury or stroke or tumors. These are the, um, so, so the, the included clinical practice guidelines are from these four developers, mainly from the United States and, um, and Scotland. So these guidelines, um, I'm not going to go into detail, but they're all rated using the Agree to Instrument, which, which also stands for the Praiser for, of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation. And as you can see, uh, sorry, they score quite, quite, quite a high, um, high number, so more than five out of seven. So they are ma mainly of good quality guidelines. Oops. For evidence-based rehab interventions, all guidelines recommended multidisciplinary rehab with a goal-focused program. Family and patient education is important as well to facilitate self-awareness and management of the disability in TBI. So the education main will include um, looking at the basic function of the brain, the effects of uh, traumatic brain injury, what kind of rehab interventions they'll be receiving um, in, in the rehab ward or in the community, social supports, and um, even uh, long and lo long-term and short-term goals and their prognosis. The level two evidence looking at physical rehabilitation in patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, looking at physical therapy to improve their balance, strength, posture control, walking using treadmill or overground training. There are no difference between these two in terms of evidence and um, mobility aids as required. And for functional tasks, ADLs, you can look into repetitive and task-specific training. Now, cognitive rehabilitation, you've got functional skill training, metacognitive strategies, behavior interventions. Um, for memory, to improve memory, you've got compensatory strategies, looking, lo using a diary, a notebook, or an alarm clock, and other assistive technologies, a computer, laptop. And for patients with mild traumatic brain injury, cognitive assessment is not routinely recommended, if not indicated. Now, John has covered the, um, the rehabilitation of, of behavior and um, um, aggressive patients, so I'm not going to go into that. But there are evidence looking at um, cognitive behavior therapy in patients with mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. As for communication, you, got, you have got um, the cognitive, cognitive uh, linguistic therapy for language deficits using AAC devices, for example, um, alphabet boards, word books, um, computer speech generation devices. These can be helpful as well. Um, melodic intonation therapy, mainly for patients with expressive dysphagia or non-fluent non aphasia. So sw swallowing um, strategies, you've got um, adjusting the posture, sitting upright, diet modification, and restorative techniques, those that strengthen your neuromuscular control. Level one evidence to recommend visual scanning strategies for patients with visual deficits or uh, visual field defects, or even visual neglect. 
and sleep management that's important as well because a lot of patients with traumatic brain injury they don't they don't get enough sleep and that's a that that's quite a, a common complaint so teaching them on um, sleep hygiene if, if they if they are able to um, 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 if, if, if if you can um, psychological interventions like relaxation therapy um, for patients with mild traumatic brain injury no strenuous um, physical activities at least two hours before bedtime and modify the sleep environment. So making sure that the bedroom is for sleeping and not for working or TV or video games and so on. Now getting the patient back to driving and working, that's very important and it, and it improves their quality of life. So if once they are once they're able to referring them for a cognitive assessment and neuropsychological assessment or an OT driving assessment, that's important. Getting them back to working. So um, different health services, we've got um, gradual return to work program that can be looked at as well. So the rehabilitation team will work in uh, uh, liaison with the employer. So some patients with cognitive deficits, so they might require modified duties or even part-time work and then um, eventually transition to full-time work if they're able. Service delivery, again, inpatients for moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, and you've got community services and supports, and now with the NDIS program, and um, behavior plans, and, um, and drug and alcohol programs, and telemedicine is becoming more and more famous now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And sorry for the busy slide, this is just to highlight that there are many rehab interventions with a different level of evidence that's available out there. Now, this is another um, study that we've um, conducted looking at Cochrane evidence in TBR rehab interventions. And then, as you can see, so, oops, multidisciplinary rehabilitation, you've got a, a, a moderate level of evidence. Psychological interventions for patients with mild traumatic brain injury, um, CBT, as I've mentioned just now, for patients with anxiety, you've got a good level of evidence as well. And, um, and, um, and as, as John mentioned just now, beta blocker, you've got uh, a moderate level of evidence as well. As for the uh, outcomes of TBI, this was a paper that was, um, oh, sorry, um, for patients with mild traumatic brain injury, they rarely require inpatient rehab and most of them will recover. However, some of them will have persisting post-concussive symptoms and they do often have physical complaints like headaches, insomnia, irritability, memory issues, um, and so on. So 10, of, 10 to 15 of them will remain symptomatic and the treatment of that would be reassurance, um, um, counseling, education, and psychological intervention. So and as for patients with uh, moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. This is a paper that was um, conducted by Professor Farikan Khan in 2016. Um, it, it, it was a prospective um, cross-sectional study looking at long-term function and psychological outcomes in moderate to severe TBI. So the cord of this patient came through the Royal Melbourne Trauma Care. And it showed some change in their physical and cognitive function. There was high levels of uh, psychological issues like depression, Again, caregiver strain and burden, that's, um, that's almost, that's more than half of them. And factors associated with poor function included those um, who are older, um, more than 60 years of age, with TBI-related symptoms, um, those without, who didn't receive rehabilitation, and those classified in a severe disability category on admission. This is a paper um, by Ponsford et al. in 2014, one of John's paper, looking at the 10-year follow-up study following a TBI. And the most common neurological symptoms, um, fatigue and balance. Uh, quite a good number of them had good mobility and, um, and, um, and function outcomes. And 60% of them still reported changes in their cognition and behavior and emotional functions. So approximately 50% of them return to their leisure activities, 40% of them require more support, but um, less than 50 of them were employed. Now the conclusion, um, I would like to highlight how uh, the importance of multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Um, it is important for a patient's functional recovery, especially when rehabilitation is shifting more from the inpatient to the ambulatory service. So we're, we're seeing more of them, more and more of them out there in the community. 
And it is important to understand the impact of um, TBI in the long term, so beyond the acute phase as well. And we should um, focus more on the patient's um, cognition, psychological and social functions, and getting them back, integrating into, into the community. So um, where we should also look at sustainable rehabilitation models um, that can be um, used to improve the longer term outcomes, to look at um, um, patients who are lost to follow up, patients in the community, those who require um, a rehabilitation input. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Lee. So we'll, um, it'll just take us a minute or two to set up for questions. So we'll, we'll put on, go on to a, um, a holding slide whilst we uh, readjust the chairs in here uh, for the panel in a COVID safe manner. So just give us a minute or two and we'll be back online. Welcome back. Okay, so we might take, start off by taking a look at the poll results. Wait for a minute for them to come up, or there we go. That's nah, not advancing if you don't. Yep. All right, so what's that? Uh, how are we going to interpret that one? So they have gone earlier. They've gone a little bit earlier for that one. Uh, brave is a comment from Professor Drummond. Next, uh, next one. Uh, a little, let me see, a little less brave, perhaps, uh, for that one, and that's what would be that was flagged as um, great for potential for blossoming there. And the next slide. The, 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 yeah. The changes in the poll yeah. Are not all in the same direction. No, 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 and we. Yes. Yes. We can see here there's quite a marked reduction of early um, chemoprophylaxis in there, and that's um, that ain't a bad thing. I think that would be consistent with what uh, most of us would think. And uh, the last one, and another um, reduction uh, in early uh, desire for early um, chemoprophylaxis. So um, uh, I think we're probably going to have to come down to paper, scissors, rock to work out who gets the better chocolate. <laughs> Uh, so we'll do that in our own time, and we might move on to some um, some questions then. So, uh, so the first question we'll go back to the start for Alex: Does the degree and or duration of total body hypoperfusion on admission affect subsequent cerebral edema, tissue oxygenation, etc., on days five to six? So. Uh, the question was the degree of hypoperfusion at the injury. So, for example, hypoxia or hypotension. Um, well, those were, would have profound uh, effects from, from the outset, not necessarily uh, out at day five or seven. Uh, we think that the changes happen at day five are because of the CO2 reactivity recovering. But uh, somebody who's had um, hypotension below 90, for example, we know from Ch Randall Chestnut studies that they'll have double the mortality. Uh, the same with hypoxia, less than, uh, with SADs less than 90%, they'll have double the mortality. But that's at the outset. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and one for uh, Kate and Chris, where are you skiing this year? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Who, who's best positioned to consider the question re chemo prophylaxis on a daily basis? Uh, trauma surgeons or neurosurgeons has uh, been put in the question, but I would add. Does a physician or a haematologist need to be involved? I, th I think that that would be a good thing if in, in a big institution you, you could have um, sort of a regular multidisciplinary round. Um, that would be, I think that would be, that would be good. I, th I think the, the main decision making is going to need to be by the neurosurgeon um, who, who's understood the anatomy of the, of, the, of the injury, of the bleed, and of the surgery, but I think a partnership would be a good thing. I think the worst thing is what we do, which is the, the intensivist does a round, and they say to the registrar, will you uh, 
ask the neurosurgeons when we can start DVT prophylaxis. And the registrar says to the resident, will you ask the neurosurgeons when they'll start DVT prophylaxis? And that resident then asks the neurosurgery resident, when can we start DVT prophylaxis? Who then asks the neurosurgery registrar, who may or may not then speak to their boss, which to me seems the worst version of how to make a nuanced decision about a complex patient. And it would seem to me that somehow we should manage to get the two or even three consultants in the same room at some stage yeah, I, I, I to, think, to, to have a plan. I think if it's very complex, we, the, 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 con, the small contribution that we can, haematologists can make, we'd prefer to be in the loop early rather than to be pulled in uh, downstream of a whole lot of thought processes, Kate. But we, we usually only call you when we're up to our little cotton socks in blood in the operating room, uh, don't we? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Chris. Or, we should. That, no, you're right. It should be. It should be early, and it should be senior decision makers. Great. Thanks. Um, a few questions about rehab, and I guess this reflects the delay in rehab, but the first question is, does the delay or prolong wait for ABI rehab in the acute hospital affect long-term outcomes? John? Um, I would argue somewhat controversially that uh, we can admit people um, to rehab on the day of referral if they're ready to participate in rehab. Um, the studies sort of show that if a person has a um, uh, Glasgow uh, coma of seven or eight or above, then you can engage them in some form of active participation. Um, but there are a lot of uh, patients that either with extreme behaviour or with um, uh, extreme sort of cognitive problems or uh, minimal responsive state, they're just, there's no rehab goals and they're where the delay happens while you're waiting for them to, uh, to improve. Um, I think in, in Melbourne we seem to have enough uh, rehab beds, it's, uh, it's enough, uh, well not, not in all places, but um, we, can, we can get patients in but you've got to be able to start rehab, otherwise you've got a very expensive group of therapists waiting there that aren't able to engage with the patient. Um, having said that, I mean, we admit over 95% in post-traumatic amnesia and you can never tell when they're going to be ready to engage in rehab. Um, but, uh, you know, there might be some need for some sort of step-down facility when they've uh, stopped acute care but they're not really ready to engage in rehabilitation, which is an active learning process. It's not necessarily as passively done to a person. And I guess following on from that, for PTA management in the acute hospital setting, is there likely or should there be a shift towards Tegretol, beta blockers, that sort of medication, as well as some of the other strategies you use? Well, I, I know that in some trauma centre in Melbourne, they have got uh, Craig bed equivalents. Uh, and, uh, they use low stimulation environments. It's much more difficult in an acute hospital, particularly when they're needing acute care and they've got um, you know, intercostal catheters and uh, IVs and, and uh, all sorts of things that make their care a lot more difficult. Um, so sometimes the sort of milder use of um, uh, drugs like Tegretol and, and beta blocker, which are effective, but not in extreme behaviour. And if someone's going to de damage themselves or, or interfere with their acute management, et cetera, then you've got to use um, more powerful drugs. And so uh, I, I think um, whilst low stimulation could be looked at more in acute hospitals, in general terms, uh, you, um, you've got to control the behaviour for the patient's sake. And so you may have to use um, medication that with more time we can sort of slowly withdraw and use uh, more of a physical environment approach to, to uh, behaviour in the acute stage, in the PTA stage. Great. Uh, and a rather complex one, but we'll see if we can get it done in a minute or two. Can, would someone like to tell us about the new guideline and the difference between disorders of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia? No. There's a, there's 
Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, there's, what's the difference between disorders of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia? Yeah, so I guess disorders of consciousness is when um, the neurological behaviours that we're seeing are very minimal. Um, that's when we're looking at things like neurobehaviours or responses, so pain reflexes, um, I guess uh, startle and these lower level things that we see. Uh, so at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, we manage that via the coma recovery scale through our occupational therapy team and the speech pathology team. And that is administered um, initially five times over a two week period. And then we administer that as required moving forward. And uh, that could be once a week if the patient's not showing a great improvement in their neurological behavior. Uh, then with post-traumatic amnesia, we are trying to reduce stimulation to that person and we monitor them via the Westmead post-traumatic amnesia scale. The difference particularly is when they're in a disorder of consciousness, we're trying to increase stimulation, uh, sensory stimulation, um, noise, sound, encouraging family to talk to them, interact with them, try to increase stimulation. And when someone is in post-traumatic amnesia, we're trying to reduce stimulation where possible. Thanks. And lastly, is there evidence linked between discharge destination and long-term cognitive outcome? Um, the, the key to discharge destination is social supports. And everyone that has good social supports, irrespective of cognitive or physical disability has a better chance of uh, returning to a more normal family sort of lifestyle. So it, it, whilst it can, I mean, people with severe disability may need a lot of care, um, but with uh, attended care programs in our, some of our compensable systems and now um, attended care programs through our uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme, we're able to get a lot more people home if their family are, are willing. So it, I, I think it's mainly to do with um, social supports uh, rather than the degree of disability. John, could the uh, patient he presented, um, would have been well served if uh, he got his job back in the cafe, his rehab? Yes, and um, we haven't done long-term follow-up because he actually went back to the regional centre for his outpatient program. but. Because it's an old, well-learned skill and it's a, he had a fairly basic task in the cafe, there is some expectation that he'll be able to go back there in the longer term. He may have difficulty learning more things more complex or, or other things, but so, so with old, well-learned skills that he's got, hopefully in the longer term he'll be able to get back to um, you know, uh, employment which uh, will settle him and uh, hopefully the addiction medicine um, programs that he'll be engaged in uh, will work. Um, you know, but uh, it, it's, um, you can't tell in the first few months, it's the longer term one to two year outcomes that um, show what happens there. Usually they're isolated a bit from their social group who often influence the negative behaviours and that can be, a, again, a positive influence uh, of family. All right, well, we're about, to, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, we're about out of time, so we might wrap it up um, there. So uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their, um, their time and their effort and their, their fantastic presentations. And those of you that have logged in, um, thank you for doing so uh, in this uh, new COVID normal. Uh, I'll highlight to you that the next Victoria Trauma Grand Run round will be in February. The exact date uh, is uh, to be determined, uh, and that will be uh, uh, chaired by Ambulance Victoria. Um, so once again, thank you for all your attention, uh, and uh, good evening, and if you're on the other side of the world, good morning. <laughs>